Hello and welcome to the Rams Review Podcast. Discussion, insights, analysis, all passion, all derby. Some decisions are black and white. Let's get stuck in. Hello everybody and welcome to the Rams Review podcast. Um, today it's it's finally time for the season review. Joining me as always, Corey. Corey, how are we? Jason, how are you? Yeah, I'm all right, thanks. And today a very special guest, Ollie Wright from the Derby County blogcast, what was Derby County blog now. Ollie, how are we doing, mate? We're good, yeah. It's a bit of both now, so the Derby County blog still goes. I do... I do um... I do, I do remember sort of reports. I kind of make them a bit more sporadic than they used to be, uh, but I do um, obviously do the podcast as well. So I'm now, the reason that this was I'm pleased to be asked to do this is because it's nice to actually answer some questions rather than having to ask them, which is my kind of role on the blogcast is I kind of do the, your job. So it's nice to, it's nice to just be in the background and let somebody else worry about all the editing and you, stuff. You didn't, just, you didn't bring any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought you were bringing the questions. I can if you want. I'll chair it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I must admit, Ollie, I did listen to the the latest episode that you did with the um, the or oh, whatever his name is, the eleven points guy tactics uh, episode. That was uh, that was intriguing. Um, I must admit. So, unfortunately, it's going to be a pretty similar chat. Um, mm-hmm. But obviously, <laughs> uh, we, we can only say so much. Um, we're going to roll roll straight into it. First, I, I, I am going to touch on Barrow slightly, um, even though it was an absolute d- disgrace of a result, really. Um, but I think we've got to touch on it first. Um, Ollie, one of the things that I said to Corey last week, we did a we did the preview, and I said that I wouldn't have been surprised with it going to penalties, to be perfectly honest with you. And if even the Barrow lads that we had on, we had somebody on from BBC Radio Cumbria, who went, are you joking? I'm like, no, no, because I, I know what's coming because we have, obviously, as you well know, four, five, six, possibly even seven first teamers out. Mm. We knew what kind of a side was coming on Saturday. Um, we got pretty much what I was fully expecting, quite a, a lacklustre performance, absolutely stinking of the need for, for quality, to be perfectly honest with you, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it felt like um, a pre-season game, didn't it? You know, it's, yeah. that's kind of where we, we are, you know. I was a little bit surprised with um, the way they addressed pre-season because I didn't feel like they did very many friendlies. So I didn't feel like anybody would have got, like, very few players, if any, got 90 minutes at any time, really. Mm. So um, it almost felt like, well, we're going to be undercooked, aren't we? And we definitely were. Um, and yeah, so I suppose the positives out of it are a few. Um, I'm trying to find some positives. I mean, the, the main positive for me to take out that game, to try and focus on those, um, would be after Lee Buchanan moved to left wing back, I thought he looked really, really good. And I yeah. thought he looked like every time he got the ball, he looked like he could take on their fullback and just have him on toast, basically. And I thought it really that I suppose the issue with Bogle and Lowe and the deal and then put being pulled from the squad, it clearly knackered the idea of playing with three back three and wing backs. Because, you know, Lowe could have played on the left, Bogle, Bogle obviously would have played on the right. Um, nobody else to play right wing back at all. Um, and Lee Buchanan out there is completely a fish out of water. Um, you know, he, every time he got the ball, it was onto his left foot. And so you lose any kind of width, what, you know, and no, he didn't have any confidence to take the ball on his right foot and try and take the defender on. As soon as he got onto his natural side, he was a, literally a different player. So that was a positive to see him actually in his natural position um, was good. Um, I thought after, so after Whitaker came on, I thought we were much, 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 much better. And I thought that at that point, it, it kind of looked like a matter of time, but we ran out of time. And it was better and Marriott started to get into a few sort of dangerous positions. Um, I thought that probably the, the main problem in the first half, which was very bad, which was, was that it was too slow. Um, and also I felt like Bird was kind of dropping deep as well. So you had the three centre-backs kind of trying to play out from the back, but Max was dropping very deep as well. So you've got, all of a sudden, you've got like four players behind the ball um, or on the halfway line kind of thing. Barrow sat behind the ball and there was just no way through. Everything that went out to Forsyth's side, it was back inside. Everything that went out to Buchanan's side, it was back inside. It kind of just went around the back five, around the back five. And, you know, 
so um, yeah, so a lack of pace, a lack of directness down the wings. Um, Sibley and Marriott were swamped. They didn't have. They had so many markers around them. They just didn't, never really got on the ball, did they? Um, so it was only towards the end of the game, probably when Barrow started to tire a little bit, maybe, and Whitaker came on, uh, that we started to look like a. a you know, we, we were going to maybe get a goal at some point, but we ran out of time, obviously. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, the main plus from it is we're not, we're not out. And I think there were a few sides from the championship who lost to, you know, smaller teams. Uh, yeah. You know, so it wasn't like everybody else in the championship was smashing it up. You know, I think there were probably a few teams in the same boat as us where they're a little bit undercooked and, and not, you know, getting ready for the season. I think you're quite right. I mean, like you said, it, it almost was treated as a pre-season game because, as you well pointed out, normally you'd, you'd have those first three or four where everybody would get 45 in your legs, then you'd build it up to 60, and then your last friendly is normally, and me and Corey mentioned this last week, your last friendly is normally you're, you're 11 for that for that next league game, or obviously for the first league game. And obviously, um, I saw the game against Sheffield United on Tuesday, um, and I looked at it and I thought, well, yeah, we are five or six players missing, obviously, at the moment with Marshall being away and obviously the injuries. So I thought, yeah, you're not going to be too far away from this. But like you quite rightly say, I, d- I don't think there's been a single player that's had 90 minutes throughout the game. And it's been a, a lot more of the younger players that have had 45 minutes in second halves. But then they were nowhere near the team on Saturday, which, I mean, fair enough, they're, they're probably not ready for that. Um, but that, that did surprise me a little bit. And it's, in some respects, a little bit worrying. Um, I don't know if that was a... I, w- I don't think the word quite, it's quite disrespectful to Barrow, but I don't think we had many other options. And to be perfectly honest with you, you can't play players that are injured at the end of the day. Like you say, I, I, the, the low and bogle things clearly happened almost you know just before kickoff as such where where they were removed from the squad and it's something that I've mentioned to Corey uh, a couple of weeks I I thought we would start to grow to the point where we it was a viable option to play five at the back with what we'd got now you take Bogle out of that equation we haven't really got like you say we haven't got a right-sided player now that that can play that which obviously we've got to be looking which we're going to go on to in a little bit later, obviously the transfer market and, and where we, we have to look for somebody. Mm. It almost now brings in the need, if you're going to use that formation as a viable option, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to bring somebody in in that position. The only thing I can think of is obviously Tavirik. I know he, he moved out onto that right wing back against Sheffield United. I think he dropped it out there against Barrow on Saturday. And actually, it looks like he, he don't mind getting up the field. I noticed there was a couple of balls in that he played in from out on that right-hand side where you you think that's okay, uh, that could be a viable option. But then you listen to Koku's uh, interview saying that now he's been brought in as a central defender. Uh, so there's obviously a little bit of um, interest interest about that. And then of course, then you've got you've got the young lads, you know, coming up who we've seen in the last three or four friendlies. But you know, trying to throw them into a 46 game championship where you're going to be needed in that wing back position if you're playing that formation you've got a lot of onuses on you hell of a lot to land on somebody's shoulders at the age of 17 18 with no experience i appreciate lampard trying well did it with bogle but really have we got two in the space of three years that can do exactly the same well it'd be lucky wouldn't it i mean mm. I, I, like I said i mean um obviously when I, when I remember that before the lampard season i was a bit concerned before the start of the season because obviously i didn't have any idea how good bogle was and um, as it turned out, Vogel was, you know, was was ready to to come in, um, and yeah, touch wood. I mean, there's a couple in the there's a couple in the academy. Uh, obviously, Ebersaley, um, Jordan Brown, and then uh, the lad called Joe Bateman too, isn't there? So there's a few. But how close they are to actually being ready, I have no idea. Um, and then obviously um, to where it, yeah, he might well have to play out on the right. Um, but whether that's in a foot back four rather than about five, it's, you know, he's more of a defender, isn't he? So I, I, I would suspect that he might be an option to play right back, you know, the traditional right back in the back four, I'm not so sure about right wing back. So, hey, ho, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, until we actually see, you know, what, um, what, what Phillips got in, in his mind in terms of bringing new players in, it, it's hard to kind of judge. This is a funny time, isn't it? Because we kind of, we've just had the news about Bogle and Lowe leaving and we don't as yet know um, who is going to be brought in to replace them. So it's kind of the, it's the difficult bit where you, you're getting the pain of losing some good players and worrying about how they're going to be replaced or how the squad will shape up without them. And we don't yet know what, 
what Koku's got in mind. All I would say, I suppose, is that he did seem quite positive himself that something would happen quite quickly. Uh, so touch wood in the next couple of days, we'll be jumping around the room because we've signed somebody really good. We'll Finger, fingers crossed. And I mean, obviously, he, he's, I know he's come out. I know Dwayne Holmes has come out. I know there's one or two players that have come out and said, yes, we've been working on this 3-5-2 or 5-3-2, whatever you wish to call it, as a viable option. And as, as I've just mentioned, then you take away one of the key pieces out of that, technically, that formation. It's, it's going to be interesting to see where he goes. We know the transfer window is open till October. We know things can happen um, really quickly. Obviously, the low and Bogle one may be surprising straight away at the time when it was announced, but in the long term, probably not that surprising. Obviously, we know there's a couple more to go. Um, and I suppose it is a, is a wait and see, but I think you're right, Ollie. At the end of the day, you're through, you're in the hat, and I'm not jumping the gun here. Obviously, you see the cup, you see the draw from last night. Derby have got a cracking cracking chance if they can if they can find you know get some players back. And obviously, we concentrate on the league first. Um, but there's there's a viable pl- path to the fourth round there. To be perfectly honest with you, when when you look at it, um, obviously I heard as well the uh, the dates for these cup games. Um, I think is it the first three or four rounds are in September. So. Obviously, we'd already looked at the beginning of the season where October was looking pretty busy. December was looking pretty busy. Now, September, if you've got a cup run, it, it's it's going to be relentless. And obviously, with a with a squad like ours that's missing four or five, and from the sounds of it, not too many of the ones who are out that close to coming back, we're, we're running on bare bones, aren't we, at the moment, to be perfectly honest with you? Yeah, and, and looking at that, Jason, that was, the, that was my one concern was, you know, yeah, okay, Derby beat Barrow and Derby's in the cup and that's fine. But on the flip side of that, does Derby really need a long cup run? Because in the grand scheme of things, it's highly unlikely Derby's going to win the Carabao Cup. And it, to be honest, it's, hardly, it's, it's, it's very unlikely that Derby's going to win the FA Cup. I mean, obviously, we've, we all, all three of us are sitting here hoping that we, you know, Max Bird lifts those trophies. But in actual fact, it's probably not going to happen. And like you say, with the fixture congestion, you have December, which is loaded with insane games. You've got October, which is unloaded with an insane amount of games. And now potentially, if you keep winning the Carabao Cup, you've got an insanely large amount of games. But yet you've got a, I hate to say it, but yeah, I mean, you, 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 you're running on what? Like a 16-man squad, really? 17-man squad plus a couple untried youngsters? And, you know, it, it's, it's just going to be very difficult fixture congestion-wise to expect... I mean, we're already sitting here talking about, well, what if, what if one of the lads from the academy can step up and play 46 championship games? Well, if, if they're going to not, not, I'm not going to say they're going to struggle, but if they struggle to play 46 championship games at a high level, which as a young player is very inconsistent, you're expecting to put them on another 10 games or so for the cup and still expect to perform at a high level. And I think that Darby, in my opinion, I'm sure we'll talk about this later with predictions and everything like that. Derby this season need to be focusing on the league. And I understand the cup brings in money and things like that. But if the fans aren't there, they're not filling the seats. And so you end up, you know, you end up going away to Manchester United again and you get shellacked three or four nil or whatever it is. I just, you know, hopefully, I mean, obviously I'm glad that they beat Barrow because it would have been a massive embarrassment had they not. Uh, It's still a little bit of an embarrassment that went to penalties, but it would be very difficult, you know, to have a sustained cup run when we're talking about the bare bones that we have in the squad. I think we'll see. I think we'll see young players. I mean, you know, he'll have to prioritise the championship. And you know, we saw last year anyway um, what what Koku did when we drew Forest in in the cup, and that was when you know that was when the fans could go. So it was a full house. It was a Forest, and he still made eleven changes. So um, I don't think he will remotely prioritise the the Carabao Cup. I think he'll just basically focus on the the, the championship games. And if, he, if you know, it's an opportunity maybe for some of the younger lads to play. Um, but I, like, I think you're right. I don't, I don't think anybody will be particularly fussed. I mean, you know, no one likes losing any game. But ultimately, if we lose to, Pre- I, I, you know, hopefully we'll beat Preston and go through and maybe play Brighton in the next round. That'd be quite good. But it doesn't matter, does it? Ultimately, it's a bit of experience for maybe one or two young lads. I'd like to see Whitaker get a start if we're against either against Preston or. Uh, if not against Reading, maybe against um, Preston, that'd be good. I'd like. I thought he made a good impact when he came on against Barrow. Um, I feel a bit sad he didn't start that game, to be honest. But uh, apparently, we needed three centre backs. So, um, yeah. So, <coughs> excuse me, but yeah, I think um, I think you're right. I think prioritising wise, it's, it's it's league all the way. 
I'm quite surprised with obviously everything that's gone off, everything you've just mentioned there, Corey, is on the back of obviously a, what, two and a half week break and a three week pre-season. So it's, it, it, it's a lot. It is a lot. And obviously when you're running on that threadbare squad, it can be even worse. I'm, I appreciate sponsorship and everything is all included. I'm surprised they didn't scrap the League Cup for this year. Um, obviously the FA Cup one was probably a bit more difficult because of what it means for, for the lower league and non-league and that kind of thing but I'm quite surprised that the League Cup didn't get postponed this year I, re- I really am just just to take the weight off because let's face it you know Corey you know Ollie you get to that third, fourth round the, the Premier League team comes in they ain't going to be putting the full strength out. they never normally put the full strength out till the quarterfinals semi-finals they're certainly not going to be doing it this year because they just they just can't afford to they, they, because of the fixtures so uh, but like you said, we're through. That that's the that was the remit. It wasn't it wasn't pretty. Um, quick mention for Keller Roos: three great, three good penalty saves. Fair play to him. Um, and yeah, we're, we're through to the next round, which I believe is next Tuesday. So that's uh, that comes around pretty quick after the Reading game. So, but that that is obviously what we are mainly here to talk about, Ollie. Um, is is the season um, and Derby County? What we can expect, and in general, what's this EFL Championship going to look like in come the end of May? Um, obviously, we'll, we'll focus on Derby first. Uh, I think we pretty much our opening 10 minutes there has described exactly what's got to happen at Derby. Um, we know incomings have got to come before before the window shuts in October. Um, we know that we've got four or five, if not more, out injured that really are going to start causing a bit of an issue if they're not back, certainly before October, beginning of October, you would have thought, but with the not heard too many rumblings in terms of Tom Lawrence, obviously sounds like that one's probably a little bit longer. Martin Waghorn's off and off. And what you've got to remember is none of these have had a minutes pre-season yet. I noticed Dwayne Holmes started, obviously, Sheffield United. That was his first game and then gets thrown into it with that, tried to bring that little bit of creativeness against Barrow. And you could see he was off the pace. Mm-hmm. So this is going to be the problem. You're going to have five or six, five first-team players, who, by the looks of it, if we don't have the transfer window that we want between now and October, we're going to need them coming in all, all guns blazing. And I just don't think that's really going to, that's really going to happen. Um, and I don't want to write Derby's season off already. I mean, that would be, that would be silly of me, but you can, you can see where this could actually already be a bit of a concern that we can't, because we know we're not going to go out there, sign six or seven. I think that that's pretty obvious. We, we are going to be aiming at two, possibly three. Uh, that will bring in some quality, and that, that's obviously what we need. But when you haven't got the backbone around it because they're out injured, that's obviously going to be a li- that is going to be a little bit of a problem. Um, one of the things that me and Corey said, Ollie, was obviously for Derby to have a pretty half decent season again this year, you are going to need the likes of Sibley, Max Bird, um, B- Buchanan. Now he's involved. I was we were we did say Low and Bogle, but obviously they've moved on. They're going to have to have just as good, if not better, seasons than last season. To, to propel Derby, and it, it does seem in some respects, I appreciate the money's not there, and that is why we haven't been able to bring in um, as many as we probably would want, because in an ideal world, we probably would have chosen five or six. But the, the next step up for those youngsters can be like a, a, a new player, and obviously you've got the likes of Jack Marriott, who you're hoping is going to be in and around it this year, who's going to feel like a new player. Beelik coming in towards Christmas, potentially, maybe even a little bit earlier. That's going to feel like a new signing. It, it it feels a lot to me like you've got to try and get through this first eight nine weeks of the season with with a wink and almost a wink and a prayer. It's probably not the right the right sentence, but you've got to try and get to that October November time when you're hoping that you've got some players back fit. You've obviously you've brought some in. They've probably got four or five games under the belt. They've settled to the championship, dependent on obviously where they're coming from. Um. And then, as we always say, until after Christmas, and this year is going to be completely different again, but until Christmas, you don't really know where you are in, in terms of teams in the leagues. Um, one of the things that, obviously, I've listened to a few podcasts, I'll say I've listened to your own uh, with, a, with a preview, I've listened to a couple of others in the Championship, and there are my, my opinion of who is going to be in and around the, the the promotion race this year has changed in the last three or four weeks about five times just due to the people that some teams are signing that, you know, the players that they're able to get through the door 
does make you feel a little tiny bit envious, but of course they are the ones who've got the parachute payments and things like that. But um, in focusing it on Derby first, then then we'll split to the other teams, Ollie. Mm. Where where do you think? Where, where where is it a case of get a get a dart and throw it at a board and and just just come up with a number because it feels that way a little bit this season to be honest with you. Um, I think no. I think we are. I think we've got a top half squad um, without a shadow of a doubt. I think you're right that it, we are just unfortunate that the injuries are all clustered in the the, the attack. That's the problem. If if it was you know if it was one defender, one midfielder, one fullback, one striker, it'd be probably all right. But it seems like it's all the attacking threats are all out. So that's really, really, really tough. Um, so yeah, you're right. We, we're badly missing Waggy. Um, you know, obviously Martin's not been replaced as yet either. So um, yeah, until it's, yeah, until we know exactly who Koku's going to sign, it's, it's difficult. But I do genuinely believe that we've got sufficient quality to finish in the top half. Top six is about several things dropping our way really and the young players as you sort of mentioned they're continuing their development because we all know how frighteningly talented they are um you know I mean one of my mates texted me the other day to tell me Max Berber is going to be the captain of England which <laughs> sure I don't know I like but you know it, it's true that he's clearly a Premier League player in waiting same with Sibley um you know I've seen people that I respect kind of tweeting I doubt he'll even spend the whole season with Derby before you know somebody takes him so we'll have to see um, you know, I hope he does clearly. Um, but you know, we know how good they are. I, 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 we didn't mention Jason Knight either, who scored a fair few goals last season. You know, I think you know it's it's hard to you know it's, it's easy to sort of forget actually that that's pretty impressive too because he's only what nineteen. So you know, he, he got like six goals as a as a midfielder. That's not bad at all. Um, I think he should be aiming for 10, 10 this season if he plays you know the sort of games that I think he deserves to. And he and so, yeah, we're asking a lot from the young players. But at the, at this point in time, they're delivering. You know, I mean, Sibley's impact towards the end of last season was phenomenal. I mean, how 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 he's going to go over a full season? Clearly, we don't know yet. He's not had that experience, but the potential's there. And I think I think I think that's it with us. We've got bags and bags and bags of potential. Um, and I, but I think we probably have to accept that. You know if the young players aren't quite ready to take us into the top six, then that's just the way it is, you know. Um, and I hope as well that we don't have to sell, you know, the crown jewels, if you like. I mean, we've obviously we've lost Bogle, we've lost Lowe. Um, I think I, I wasn't quite so surprised as, as, as some people maybe that Max went. Um, Bogle, I think a lot of people kind of understood it might be, you know, it might have to be that you'd have to go. Um, but I think the, the club will be, you know, kind of, they would it would be last resort for some of the others to go. So um as long as we can keep them, as long as they keep getting get getting better and better, I think we're gonna have a pretty decent season. But yeah, like you said, desperately need some back. I think Rooney's meant to be the first one back, isn't he? I don't mm-hmm. think he's bad. So if we get Rooney back, that'll add some leadership. Um, albeit and, and who knows, he might even end up playing higher up the pitch, um, for want of other options. Um, so you know, that's a possibility. Um but I do, I do like the squad. I, you know, obviously it is frustrating that everyone's not fit. Um, uh, but I do, I do like the players that we've got. So I think I do feel relatively positive about us. Um, but top six, I wouldn't be a hundred percent confident about predicting that at the moment. Corey, yeah, I think I think you know I've read a lot on on online, and I kind of share all these sentiments in a way. A lot of people online, you know, oh, this is the year and, and Derby's got this great young squad, but I don't think I'm necessarily as bullish um, as them. Um, and I would and I would have to say with Ollie, I think, I think probably, I, I think I would probably predict Derby to finish between eight and 10. I think that's pretty fair. That's pretty much where we were last year. And then when you look at from last year, which, you know, finished a month ago to this year, um, there's not been a massive amount of improvement. Um, you know, they've lost, they've lost, Derby's lost a couple of key players with, with Martin and obviously Bogle and Lowe. They've only replaced a couple of them, obviously, because of finances and things like that. And I'm sure there'll be more incomings. Um, and I'm just, you know, for me, yeah, the, the youngsters have bags and bags of potential. And it's probably the best group of youngsters that have come together, you know, obviously since Hendrick and Hughes came up kind of together. Um, but, you know, to have the three or four, five even players that we had, come up at the same time when you look at Buchanan, Knight, Sibley, Bird. Um, 
to rely on a lot of these players for an entire season is going to be really difficult because of the fact that, you know, young players are due to inconsistency. We saw Sibley, he, he scored against Blackburn, he scored the hat trick against Millwall, and he was doing okay. But the last three or four games of the season, he was completely non-existent because he was marked out of the game. And, you know, Bird's kind of there doing his thing. Um, Buchanan, again, didn't see much of him after the, the incident in October and everything like that because he, he, was, he played a bit early on and then he was kind of non-existent until the last couple of weeks of the season. So it's going to be really difficult, in my opinion, just to see how, you know, to rely on a player for, for that much. I mean, I think I would be a little bit more bullish if Darby had two, three, maybe even four really proven championship, you know, goal scorer, creative midfielder, you know, real proven kind of people at this, at this level, you know, um, and then have these youngsters come into that squad. But for Darby to be, for Darby to be really pulling up any trees this season, you're going to need Jack Marriott, who's not really fired on all cylinders for a year and a half. Maybe, you know, since the cup game really with Lampard, he's going to need to have a great season. The, the four, the four youngsters are going to, again, have to play out of their skin. You're going to have to make sure that Clark doesn't regress from where he was last season, that he continues to grow and develop. You're going to hope that Tavirik, you know, is the player that we think that he is. Obviously, he's not Virgil van Dijk. <laughs> People think he's Virgil van Dijk. He's not. But there's nothing to take away from him. But he's going to have to have a great season. David Marshall is going to have to make sure that he can maintain his levels at, you know, he's getting a year older. And we obviously, we've talked about a goalkeeper and how they have a different peak. And you're going to have to make sure Rooney doesn't continue this decline that he had over the past month of last season where, he couldn't pick out a white shirt sometimes and things like that. So there's a lot of things going to have to go right for Darby. In addition to the youngsters as well, they're going to have to come in. Um, but, you know, hopefully Barrow's the litmus test and it can really only get better, I guess. So, I mean, for me, it would be, it would be between eight and 10. I think I would be very happy, um, you know, as, as a fan. And I think the, the biggest thing that would be, would be very helpful is just stay out of the papers, stay out of the EFL lawyer's office, uh, you know, just, just do things the proper way on the field and off the field for a year. And then everything, everything will be a lot better. Uh, you know, the, the grass, the, the, the sun will come out tomorrow kind of thing, but you know, there's a lot of things that have to go right for Darby this year to, 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 to get into the playoffs. Like Ollie said. Yeah. Um, to be fair, listening to them all out there, Corey, it seems a bit of an uphill task, uh, to be perfectly honest I'm with you. I'm sorry to be so negative. I, I, I'm trying to be positive as much as I can. I think, sorry, Ollie. I'm normally the positive one, and Jason's normally the negative one. So, sorry. <laughs> well, I'll try and do the positive then. If you guys are both on a, on a massive downer, I'll try and, um, <laughs> I'll try and cheer you up. Um, I think, you know, we should, we should be positive without being, uh, you know, kind of overly you know kind of we shouldn't be expecting you know I think we need to try you know we have to understand that we've got I don't think it's normal for a, a team to have this many teenagers playing such an important role and I think to be a functioning team at championship level and to have this many kids is is extraordinary really um, and you know we have to be massively like kudos to Kaku uh, for bringing him through, and to them really for 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 doing so well. But yeah, it's just as long as we kind of don't expect them to just smash the league, um, you know. But Louis Sibley, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, what's what's his ceiling? What could he do? You know, could he score fifteen, twenty goals this season? I think he could, but you know. At the same time, he might he might struggle, uh, as you say. He's, he's going to be kicked. He's going to be a man mark. He's got that little edge to him, hasn't he? Where if he is kicked, he does react. Um, you know, he, he gets booked an awful lot. He gets in people's faces. I think there was even at Sheffield United in the friendly, he was in so he was in a player's face, wasn't he? It was, it's like yeah. this is a this is a friendly man. You know, <laughs> calm down. But he's, yeah. that, isn't, that isn't that isn't him. You know, he's got that fire in his belly where you know he stands up for himself. He reacts. So, I mean, opp opponents will definitely be, like, on him like that and they'll be niggling at him, niggling at him, trying to get him to kick him. So, he's going to have to learn to play on the edge but not go over the edge, which is difficult. I think I think Cocker quite likes that in him. I think he likes players who've got a bit about them in that way. I'm sure he said things like in the past where we had a scrap, almost had a scrap on the pitch and he, at the end of the game he was like, well, I don't, want, I don't want teams messing with us and stuff. He kind of was almost backing his players up, you know. So, um, yeah, so... That's anyway. That's one subplot in a lot of subplots, and I think it's very wise words, Corey, that we need to 
have a calmer season where it's not dogged by all this absolute nonsense going off off the pitch. I mean, you know, like the financial issues have been horrendous, the the misbehaviour and, and, you know, everything that happened. We don't need to rehearse all that again, but we do not need any more kind of stuff like that. You know, it would be lovely if, if Koku could just actually focus on what's going on on the pitch instead of spending his whole time, you know, dealing with this kind of nonsense. Um, I'm sure everybody, like, gives him massive credit for the, the dignity and, and also the kind of professionalism which he showed all the way through that season when a lesser character, I think, would have been swamped by it all. The, you know, the, so. the, one th- the one thing I want to say, Ollie and Jason, before we turn it over to you for your prediction is, I think you're dead on there. We talked about it on a pod, uh, what, maybe a couple of months ago, Jason, that the, the, the expectations uh, need, need to change because you can't be expecting, obviously, you want to win promotion. And we, we, all, we all sit here, we all want the best for Derby. That's why we do podcasts. That's why we do writing. That's why we go to the games. That's why we do, we do what we do, right? But I think it's the expectation that needs to be tempered down because under Cluffy, it was like, well, we'll just hope we'll stay in the league. And then we won a few games. We were like, yes. But now since McLaren, you know, and, and Derby's been knocking on the door of the playoffs for the last five or six years, it's, well, we deserve pre- Premier League football. We deserve Premier League football. We deserve this. And I think right now, I think it literally has to be a reset button where we have to go, look, Derby County is, for me, Derby County is a mid-table team. That doesn't mean I'm not going to enjoy the season. I want the kids to play. I want the kids to do well. Um, but let the kids play. But at the same time, let me not sit here and expect, you know, five or six, 18 year olds to, to smash the league as well, like you say. So for me, you know, when I say I'm not as bullish, it's just because my expectations probably aren't as bullish as well. And my expectations and the way I play kind of emerge together in, in a way because you don't, you can't, like you say, you can't sit here and expect them all to just cakewalk the league. I mean, that'd be great if they did, don't get me wrong. Uh, but, you know, it, it's all expectation management. Jason? Yeah, I, th- I think what we've got to remember is Koku was brought in to do a certain thing that Mel wants him to do, which is obviously we know bring in the kids. He's in year two of a four-year plan. And the first year was absolute full of, excuse the language, just complete and utter shit that he had to deal with. Um, obviously... He's, we're coming into a second season now. I mean, without without COVID, it, it was a it was a it was a poor it was a difficult year for Koku. He's come into a second year as we've just obviously talked over players out injured, so he's not actually got the preseason that he wants. He's not got a full preseason again. He's if he's agreed to it or not, who knows? He's had two of his first team have sold. Chances are there's probably going to be at least another one or two go probably not first teamers I, I get all that like you say ollie who knows where sibley is going to be in january we, we just or bird or whoever so he could end up losing even more of his first team so to actually be in the conversation to be up in that top top half definitely like you say knocking on the door of the playoffs is nothing short of incredible really Especially when you do look look throughout the team, there are qualities. You're quite right. There are qualities. There are some standout qualities on a very inconsistent basis, which is obviously why they're playing in the championship. And when we get all that, so actually, you say there, Ollie, which one of the things that we said about Sibley. I mean, what he got five in ten the back end of last season, five in six, set up another two or three. You put that across the season, and he, he he does go on to get twenty plus, setting up ten fifteen. I'm not trying to put pressure on the lad, but if he can replicate that over a forty six game season, and he's playing in midfield, you you get a striker involved who's in fifteen twenty goals. Th- that that puts Dobby in a completely different position. I mean, one of the things that I said, we, me and Corey have discussed. You look under under McLaren, under Lampard, we were beating teams 4-5-0, 4-5-1. Not on a hugely consistent basis under Lampard, but we were putting four and five past teams. Last season was Stoke, and that was it. And I mean, we were absolutely in blistering form that night. There was no doubt about it. All the other rest of the games just weren't... We, we didn't really do that all too often. I remember going to Hillsborough and watching us obviously beat Sheffield, Sheffield Wednesday 3. What That was a brilliant first-half performance from Derby. Um, Chris Martin obviously in particular and, and Tom Lawrence then take away I don't think there was too many times under McLaren probably a more so because of the style of football but I don't remember too many times against Lampard where we 
certainly went away and got turned over that many times. Last season, you lose count of the amount of games that we we went away. Obviously, we know it was poor form, but just just rolled over before half time practically. So obviously, they are two big things that do a need to change, but b you kind of know what you're aiming to do to change those. I said, I said to Corey, you've got to cut, what was it, 64 goals conceded last season? Well too many. If you can take away 15, maybe 20 of those at a push, that's massive. Our top goal scorer last season was 12. That's not enough for a, for a top six side, and we know that. You get to this season 15 plus, that probably adds another 10, 15 goals. So all of a sudden, you've had a, almost a 30-goal swing on what we've done the season previous. I mean, that equated to points anybody could guess. But you would expect that's going to add at least, 10, at least 10 points, you would hope. 10 points on what we got this season puts us, puts us in the playoffs. What would have been, for, for the for large majority of it, I'd have probably stood at the end of the season and gone, well, how did we end up in the playoffs? Because I don't ever remember us playing that solidly at all. So I think it's it, in in some respects it's quite easy to go at this end of this season. It was easy to go right. Well, we know we we know what we've got to change. It's probably worse, say under McLaren, where we got all the way to the playoff final, but we probably stood at the end of that, scratching our heads, not knowing how we got up, and then in that close season, go well. How, how do we actually go one better? Because for all intents and purposes, we were we were up on that day. We we, we got promoted bar bar you know whatever happened. So, the, obviously, the mindset changes. Kind of the same under Lampard. Obviously, one of the things with Lampard was, obviously, they we know they removed three of the, what are now, you know, Premier League players. So, we get that. But I, th- I think it's probably easier. doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be any easier to rectify those because we know, obviously, we're going to need money. Who knows what the actual figure is for Bogle and Lowe? we've heard anything between 10 and 15 who knows how much of that's up front it probably turns out that, that a couple of millions up front you, you just really don't know with those kind of deals Sheffield United aren't necessarily a team that spend big um, they're quite shrewd businessmen and we're a set, we, we are in a position where we need to sell everybody knows that so I'd be surprised if it, it, it may well be 10, 50 million but I'd be surprised if we're getting that much up front um, and obviously we're sailing so close to the wind with all the finances how much of that can actually be Respent in terms of straight away, or is it a bit more of a gamble and go? Well, we know we've got this money coming in over the course of twelve months. We can actually take a gamble at it, especially with obviously coronavirus are putting a hold on the uh, FFP for a year. Maybe he does go well for leather, and then if so, if something does go wrong in, in this season, January end of the season, you will gonna you are gonna lose your likes of Max Bird, Louis Sibley, because he's gonna have to cash in on them because of a strange uh, difficult choices he's had to make i think with all that rolled into one <sighs> who knows who knows where derby can finish this year because i really i really don't know i mean we saw it last season did i expect us to be languishing towards the bottom before rooney came in no was it did i was it fair on the performances that we were seeing on the pitch well, absolutely because they weren't good enough you if we can get that second half of the season team on a more consistent basis this year we can have a right good go at that and as, as we've as we've seen it can only take one or two signings and that could actually change the the complexion of the season 100 percent. but i said to you Corey, a few months ago as i say back to this four-year plan with koku if he's not having the youngsters taken off him and, and sold i would be another season of building experience this year for a go next year but because of all the financial things at Derby at the moment I'm not so sure if we can actually wait that long to have a go whilst we've got those type of players at the football club because obviously this team would be a lot worse off with the likes of Bird and Sibley and and whatever out of it and you know trying to replace them getting another one of those from the academy is a toss of a coin you don't know how they're going to take to it. I mean, Morgan Whitaker was banging goals in for, for, for fun for the under-18s. He's been in fits and starts for the first team, but huge jump, don't get me wrong. Uh, I think they were probably expecting him to do a little bit better than he possibly has um, in the first team. So, so it's a gamble. 
it is a gamble. But I think, I think actually, based on performances I saw on the pitch last year, I think we punched above our weight in all fairness to finish to finish where we did. I think actually this year that kind of like you say, Corey, that kind of bracket eight to tenth, possibly knocking on the door again. It only takes a, only takes a couple of things to swing in your in your direction. You can you can make a push. What would I and, and what I would say is probably a a more average league this year than than last year. To be fair, so it only takes a little little margin like that. It, you, you could be knocking, you could be knocking on it, but I think that's my prediction. I, th- I think everybody's everybody's kind of agreed. It's 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 certainly we're better than mid table. It, it's possibly going to take one or two, one or two think rub of the green for us to for us to push any anywhere towards those playoffs. But that's what we think on Derby. Got to have a quick mention about everybody else in the league. Um, Ollie, who's your top two? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do agree. I take your point about the, the general standard. I remember looking through and thinking, feeling like there's very much a bottom half this this year. I think there's a lot of teams who, some some seasons you kind of, you look at it and, and people say, oh, there's like 16 clubs who could who fancy the playoffs. And I, don't, I don't know if that's the case this season. I think it's a, there's a quite a few clubs who will be looking to stabilise and just, just stay up. Um, I think coronavirus, you know, has probably impacted everybody so badly that, you know, it's it's kind of, I think that's quite stark. And for smaller clubs, especially, you know, who are just dependent on match day income, that's horrific. So um, I think on that basis, I think the teams who are going to be towards the top are going to be the teams who can still afford to pay, are going to be the teams who've come down. Um, I think Watford, you know, probably have the strongest squad, I think. Um, I think signing Glenn Murray was kind of a big deal, wasn't it? So that's a big signing for them. Um, Brentford are always fascinating, aren't they? And I'm sure you probably talk about them. I know that we always mention them a lot. Um, To me, it's just about whether they can smash kind of the glass ceiling for them. Um, Mm -hmm. It's like they've kind of of been consistently very, very good over a number of years. Um, And they're just kind of getting better and better, really. So... They will probably, and they've signed Ivan Tony, obviously. So presumably, with the idea that Ollie Watkins is going to leave and he's the replacement. But um, so they will, they will massively fancy it, massively fancy their chances this season. Um, Norwich City, yeah, um, probably up there. Um, you know, again, just based on the fact they've got a bit of cash to spend. Um, Bournemouth, everybody seems to be down on Bournemouth, which is really interesting um, because, okay, they, you know, they. They're not, they've lost Eddie Howe, they're in a kind of new world and all that. But the amount of money they've brought in through sales is is incredible. Like Ake was 40 million, wasn't he? And then and they've just today, I think they've just sold Callum Wilson. So 20 more. Yeah, million. Yeah. I mean, that's, Ramsdale, the goalkeeper, went, didn't he, as well? And... Yeah, yeah, Ramsdale as well. So, I mean, that's the best part of 80 million quid. So, you know, even if um, they haven't come down with the, the strongest squad on paper, I mean, they can, surely they're going to spend if not all, a lot of, you know, they could spend a lot of money. Um, you know, I mean, there's not many other clubs who are going to be able to compete with them. If they fancy a player now, surely they can just go and get him. So that gives them a huge, a huge opportunity. Um, Forest are just tedious to watch, aren't they? I mean, that game we had against them was a horrible game. And I mean, it was a nightmare. They're like a, they're like a, a bear trap or something. You know, you like, you basically, you let, you let a goal in, you step in the trap, the, the trap snaps and then the trap just stays shut and that's it. Um, and that's effective, you know, so it gives them a chance I mean, and they sign a lot of players. I, I've lost count of how many players they've got. <laughs> um, it just, it just seems to be, they just signed, I'm sure they've signed about five more players this summer. So yeah, they have, yeah. But obviously they've, they've sold Matty Cash as well, um, which is good for their finances. Um, and I know that it's probably made a lot of people even more cross about Bogle going because, you know, oh, well, Forrest have just sold a right back for 16 million. Why haven't we got that much for him? Well, anyway, but that's a different matter. Um, so, yeah, they will they will obviously fancy the chances as well. Um, uh, Millwall, obviously, it, it's going to be an interesting one to see how they do. They did pretty well last season, didn't they? Um, so, they could be quite an interesting one. But I think, you know, I'm not going to be massively creative. I'm not going to tip a massive dark horse. I just think probably it'll be same as it ever is really the, 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 the kind of, those are the kind of teams you'd expect to be towards the top. 
Um, and on that basis, you know, with, with us maybe like having half a chance of sneaking in there somewhere. Corey, what do you reckon? Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I agree a lot with Ollie. And I mean, Brentford, Ollie Watkins is still in the building. Ben Rahm is still in the building, which I don't think we expected them to just to be in, the, in Brentford at this point. Um, obviously, the window is still open until October. If they can keep those two players, they're probably the favorites, obviously adding Ivan Tony as well. Watford, again, signing Glenn Murray, Ali, I agree. I think it was a massive move. Um, when you look at it, I saw some tweet. They have like nine first-team strikers, and it's just insane some of the names on there, um, you know, obviously with Didi and everything like that. And I think, I think they'll be good. I think they're still well-equipped. I mean, they basically got a Premier League squad more or less with minus a couple players. And, and same, with, same with Bournemouth. I mean, they've lost – Ramsdale, who played a season for him, they lost Ake, who, you know, had played for him the last couple seasons, but before that had been injured. They they've obviously lost Callum Wilson, so they'll rely on Dominic Solanke. But again, ninety five percent of their squad is the exact same team that stayed up in the Premier League for five years. Um, I think Middlesbrough will be a lot stronger than what they were last year with Warnock. Um, and I do think my I will I will be a bit creative. My dark horse, not necessarily for promotion, but I think they're going to do a lot better than a lot of people anticipate is Barnsley. I think um, Struber's done a really good job there. You know, they beat Brentford at the tail end of last season. He's made some really shrewd acquisitions um, that people not necessarily have heard of, uh, you know, from Austria and Germany and things like that. So I think they're going to be a lot, a lot solid, but I would agree. I think a lot of, if, if Derby want this league and, and it kind of takes what you said, Ollie, and what you just said, Jason, you've got this. And, and I see this a lot in American sports. Sometimes you get a team and you're like, we, we have, we, we, we've got a small window here. And in a way, Derby's got a small window because if they don't get up this year, how many of these youngsters that we've just talked about on the top of the podcast are going to be wearing a ram on their shirt this time next season? We don't know. And so the window's closing, FFP suspended, you know, Bogle and Lowe, that'll put some money in the coffers, obviously, so, so they can get the two or three players that they need. But the window's starting to close. And if Darby, looking at the league as well, if this is the time Darby want to get out of this division – this is probably the season to do it because you've got, like we said, a lot of those leads finally are not in the league. You know, um, the, these other teams that have been pests for years, West Brom, those kind of things, you know, they're, they're still going to be around or they're not in the league this year. And this is a much weaker league. Cardiff, I thought, were one of the most underprepared teams in, 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 the, uh, in the playoffs. They're still in the league, you know. So Norwich are not going to be the same. Forest, I think they're still going to be in the playoffs. So, but if this is the time that Derby really want to go for it and they want to make a big splash in the transfer market, like obviously they said last year, we've got no money. They pop up with Wayne Rooney and Christian Bielik. So <laughs> we know, we know what it's like at, at, you know, supporting Derby with getting these, you know, so-called heavy hitters in even, even going back and getting Butterfield and Johnson and Blackman. And Annie. at the time we were excited for them. We were like, Oh man, we're really making a run for it. So if this is the year to do it, this is the year. And if they need to go out and they want to go out and they want to get in the, win this division, it's there for the taking. It's there for the taking. And I think they're going to have to make two or three or four sh very shrewd acquisitions. You know, if, if you can get the lad from Poland, Javiak, or a couple other players like that, I'm still not necessarily sold on Marriott. So a new, a new center forward as well. Um, I think Darby could, Darby could do a lot better. And I know, obviously, I said my prediction, I know it's a bit negative. But when you look at the team's, that are around, Ollie just named him. There's nobody there that's really kind of like, hmm. You had an impression last year that Leeds and West Brom was going to kind of cakewalk the league away, and, and they did. And they, they hovered one and two all through the course of the season. This year, I'm, lo I'm looking at the league now. Um, I, I, th th there's not one team that I'm like, oh, yeah, this team scares the bejeebas out of me. I, I mean, I don't know if I was allowed to say bejeebas, but I did. So... Yeah, there's no team here that just frightens me to death. I think all the teams are beatable. All the game, I look at this, every team's beatable. Um, but I think if this is the year that Darby really want to go and hit it out the park, they, they, they could make some big money signings and do it. Jason? Yeah, I think it's one of the, I mean, it, it pretty much echoes both your points. And I, I am going to whip a dark horse out there uh, in a second. But I think, like you said, the teams who are coming down, obviously, they're bound to be strong. I would agree that Watford and Bournemouth are certainly more stronger just because they've been in the Premier League that that little bit longer. Obviously, Norwich went up last season, didn't particularly spend any money, kind of knew before they kicked the ball last season that chance, you know, Timo Puki wasn't going to fire them to relegate to, to safety, and we know that. 
haven't necessarily lost a lot of players from that championship side and actually they've strengthened a little bit so you know Norwich whereas I was actually thinking a couple of weeks ago because I actually didn't think Norwich were that good of a side when they went up to be perfectly honest with you certainly from what I saw of them against Derby the two, the two times they just kind of they, they just found a knack of a knack to win uh, and you know that that's fine and we, we've let's face it 2007 we did exactly the same thing we found a knack of a way to win even though the quality of the squad wasn't the strongest and it got found out in the Premier League I mean, Oli, I must admit, I was one with Bournemouth. I was thinking, eh, they're losing a lot of players. I think, like you say, though, you point out that they've made nearly 100 million. Their running costs of the club have got to be smaller than nearly everybody else in the championship. Probably bar Wickham and Luton, let's face it. Um, you would expect most of the others actually to be to be a bigger running a bigger cost. So if they want to, they certainly can do. Um It'd be interesting to see which way that goes. Watford, I think you're quite right. It's, they look the more equipped out of, the, out of everybody. But one point I was listening to um, earlier on the EFL podcast was, obviously, they're going to lose the likes. You would expect them to lose the likes of Danny Welbeck, Troy Deeney, um, Delafeu, Will Hughes, potentially. Um, Will Hughes to Newcastle alongside Hendrick. Now, that'd be interesting. But, you know, that kind of thing... And then the, obviously Ben Foster, you've got Cathcart, who's, you know, the age of him. They, they, they are going to lose a fair few there. And even the ones that stick around are probably going to have a bit of an ego thing about, oh, well, you know, we've been in the Premier League for six years. Can they actually adapt back to the champ- ways of the championship? A little bit similar to Bournemouth. That would be my only push against those. And then I think you, you look at the, the other teams, I mean, Forest, how they didn't make the playoffs is, is anybody's guess. But, you know, um, I've got quite a few. I'm right on the Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire border. So I've got quite a lot of Forest fans, uh, friends. And they said, to be fair, we didn't perform that well all year. We just, we, we churned out results. Um, and obviously, like you said there, Ollie, you know, they signed another five or six already. Just, I mean, Lyle Taylor, probably a good signing, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but when the going gets tough, they, they do seem to go missing a little bit. So I think they'll be in and around it. I mean, and then the other teams that were in there, Brentford, like you say, you, you would expect them to lose the front three or certainly two out of that front three. Brentford's history is that they'll just bring in another two people that are probably just as good, if not better. You would think that, that they've, got to, they've got to have a flop in the transfer market one season, to be honest with you. It can't be perfect all the time. Um, but I mean, even if two out of those front three go, they've still got a, an excellent squad. Um, I'd say they've brought one of the things you said there. Uh, Tony has obviously come into Brentford. Murray's gone into Watford. They're signing players, expecting their better players to go, not waiting for them to go and then start searching the market. I actually think that's quite a shrewd bit of business. Um, it, it, I mean, they, those transfers might not work out, but I think the way of doing that and going, well, if you want to go, you can go. We've got your replacement. So it's not a problem. So that that's, I think, actually quite a good bit of transfer business, to be honest. Uh, and then, like you said, Cardiff, you know what you get with Cardiff. Millwall, you know what you get with Millwall. Um, they play in a certain style. Like you say, Corey, Middlesbrough, you would expect to be decent with Neil Warnock. My dark horse is actually Birmingham City. They've, they brought in Karanka, he knows how this league works. If he can get Birmingham defensively minded, then you know, they've, they've got some quality. I, I, I've always thought Birmingham are, are, are sleeping giants in some respects. I think Blackburn, you've got to look at what they've developed over the last two or three years. Another, t- They're just waiting. Again, it's that extra 10% that's really going to kick them in there. Um, Swansea will be strong if they can replace um, Brewster. But they've got to replace him. That's going to be the thing. If they can bring in a striker, I would expect them to be up, up there. If not, I can see them struggling. Uh, obviously, we're going to be, I would expect us to be in the mix. And then like you say there, Ollie, really, other than that, I don't see too many others. I mean, no disrespect to any of them, but I mean, Stoke, some people are saying Stoke are a dark horse this year. I can't see it myself. I mean, they have signed a couple of players, uh, Fletcher and uh, John Obin Mikel, haven't they? You know, if, if they hit the ground running, who knows what they what they can do. But I, I just think there's other parts of their side that isn't strong enough. But then again, you do look at some of the players that they have got, and it does, on, on a piece of paper, it does make you wonder why they, they aren't doing better, to be honest. 
Um, so there's obviously something there not quite right. But I think I, I read something the other day that actually the second half last season, they were, they were pretty decent. It was more about the start that they made until obviously they brought in O'Neill. Um, since he came in, you know, they, they've been doing all right. So there's a possibility there. But I, I, I agree with you. I think it, it is open this year again. It's probably a bit more open in terms of definitely who's going to win it and that kind of thing. But I think in some respects, it kind of is closing a little bit on certainly the 12 teams that are going to be in that top half. I think you, I think we've practically named them. I'd be, I'd be shocked if anybody drops out of that and I'd be shocked if any um, would be, be anywhere near it. And obviously, finally, just to mention, obviously, the bottom three, Wickham, you, you hope they have a brilliant season. You, you really hope that they they upset some teams, and you hope that they're gonna they're gonna prove you prove you wrong. Can't say it myself. Um, obviously, you've got Rotherham who came up as well. Coventry who came up, didn't they? Coventry, they're a bit of an unknown quantity. Coventry, you never know with those. Actually, thinking about it, you never quite know. Um, Rotherham obviously have been a yo-yo club up and down. Um, like I say, Corey, I think Barnsley. To be honest with you, I think they've been, I think they've proven certainly on their day, and I think they're getting better at it. I think they could they could be uh, away from safety. And I think that's the other side, the flip side of the the championship this year. Whereas last season, if you had Stoke struggle, you had Huddersfield struggle, uh, Reading struggled. I don't see too many of them being dragged into a relegation battle this year. I, I kind of can see Wickham, unfortunately, are probably going to be nailed on, nailed on to go. Luton, Rotherham. I'm struggling to pick many others than that. Actually, that are going to that are going to be anywhere struggling in, in in this division. To be perfectly honest with you, I just think you have got that many teams at this level now that have been in it that long. They know they are just that too good to stay or that not, not go down. Sorry, but they just they can't. They're just in limbo, obviously, in the championship, which which is fine. It's unfortunate for the teams that are coming up. N- none of the three that have come up excite me uh, in terms of a, you would expect them to take that, you know, the next step on. I just can't can't see it personally. Um, Ollie, your thoughts at all on on, on, on you know teams who are uh, possibly cannon fodder for relegation? Well, um, the only one they only haven't mentioned I'd be interested to ask you actually is Sheffield Wednesday. Do you think they'll be all right in terms of can they can they pull out? Can they get out of the hole that they're in, or are they kind of doomed? Do you think they've got enough to to scrabble out of it from a minus twelve start? Do you know that's that's a good point. I mean, not I don't know their squad all that well. I must admit, obviously they've got a, they've got a few. Off decent players there, as we well know. Bannon, if you still, I'm guessing he's still there. You know, you've obviously got first year, maybe. Obviously, Fletcher's gone. It'd be interesting to see how many of those players. I think after the transfer window shut, you'd have a much better answer at that because I think Sheffield Wednesday first teamers, if they look at that, and I mean, we were nearly in this position, you know, a week ago. Um, um, how much of an attractive opposition would we have been with, with a 12-point deduction? So, and, and some of the other players, that certainly Bogle, certainly Low, you know, th- those kind of players. We already know Matt Clark apparently kind of was umming and ahhing about coming and then assu- or going to Middlesbrough. And then obviously as soon as the verdict came through, all of a sudden he turns up at Moore Farm. How many of the first teamers, I mean, if we'd have started with a 12-point, do you really think Rooney would be playing every week? I don't think he'd be that interested. I think one or two of the other youngsters would probably try and push away. Um, it just disheartens you straight away almost, doesn't it? Um, I, the better players at Sheffield Wednesday, I know most of them are kind of getting on as well. That might save them a little bit because let's face it, at 32, 33, where else are you going to go and probably get the kind of money that they're on? If there's any young and aspiring footballers, you know, coming through at Sheffield Wednesday, you know, had a half decent season last season. Maybe, maybe they would turn their, you know, get their heads turned if, if somebody came in, came in with something. I just think they are quite an experienced older head side that most of them, are, they probably look at it and go, well, again, it's all, if the contracts run out next season, quite a few different variables there as well, but I can see quite a few people go in, well, maybe play out until January. At the end of the day, as we know, obviously October, um, and then reopens again in January. You could find that a lot of if you know if they haven't clawed that twelve point back, um, and you know in a positive number by January, there might be a bit of a free for all. Might be a bit of a free for all there. And, and in in similar respects to 
uh, Sheffield Wednesday's hierarchy. You know, if you get to January and you're not really into double figures on a positive side, you're you're looking at relegation. You're looking at you're going to have to get rid of most of those players that you've got off your squad. So what's the best time of doing it? Get rid of them in January, save some money for six months. I could I could if they if they if they know they're going, I could get what you can while you can. I suppose um, to be perfectly honest with you, Corey. Yeah, I think you know. I, I think you're, but, you know, make negative twelve is is a big difference to make up. But again, Sheffield Wednesday's extremely experienced, and I wouldn't necessarily call them cannon fodder, but I would call them, you know, not favorites. But they're they're in the rele- they're going to be in a relegation dogfight all season. I don't think many teams are going to turn them over. I don't think they're going to go there and just be the whipping boys of the league because they're minus twelve. Because like you say, they've got a very experienced squad, and they they were decent last season. Um, I think they'll get out of the 12 points, but I mean, for them, the entire goal is survival. The entire goal is to finish like 14th and they'd probably be ecstatic at Hillsborough if they finished 14th. Um, But yeah, you know, it can go again, it can go very pear shaped as it can for most clubs, um, you know, with a few bad results and things like that. So I wouldn't expect them to be cannon fodder, be steamrolled, but they, they, they'll struggle just for the sole fact of that's four wins. So you know, that, that in and of itself is going to be a struggle because you can't just hope if they win their first four games, then that's fine. They've made it up. But ideally to make up that 12 point game is probably going to take a couple of months, maybe. Yeah, no, I, that's the thing. I mean, um, was it, I'm trying to think now, was it Sunderland a few years ago? Maybe not a points deduction, but certainly had an absolute awful start to the season and then, and then ended up going up. So, you know, it, nothing's, Nothing, nothing's um, tied up, but um, I, I just think the mindset of everybody, you know, at, at say minus 12, it's a, it's a lot. And let's face it, if you took 12 points off what they got last season, that probably puts them in, I, I haven't seen the league, at the, obviously, but I, I would, I would say that 12, taking 12 points off them would, would put them dangerously, dangerously close. And that's without having the negative mindset of starting on 12. So it, it, it could be interesting. It, it, it would be, I mean, I would, I, could I say a shame? I'm not, I don't know about that, but you know, I, I think they've got to, they've got to look at it in a, in a serious way and really, really try and piece themselves back together as a team and go, you know, we've, we've really got to get ourselves out of this because that, I mean, Sheffield Wednesday in league one would be, I know they've been there before, but you know, that would be a, that would be a big, big thing. That, that would be a big, big thing for them. And obviously you, a team like that could, with that, um, obviously loss of finances you, you may see you may wait years to see them again up in the championship so it, it will it will be interesting but we'll have to wait and see on that but yeah i'd forgotten about that one ollie it's, it's a good point with everything that goes off on derby i'd completely forgotten sheffield wentz he'd already got one i mean that would have been interesting if we both had started on 12 points that would have been fun but obviously not the case so i think that pretty much wraps up the efl um preview oh no we've, we've got to mention saturday we've got a couple of minutes left focus red in not a bad not a bad start at home um i would have said i was a lot more confident before saturday from what i saw uh against barrow not necessarily sure that there's going to be anybody back in terms of injury be interesting to see if anybody comes in um, and if whoever do comes in, if they're anywhere near a, a, a first team start in terms of fitness, but we've had Reading before on the first day of the season. Last time we beat them, I don't think you can really, you couldn't really want for a, for a. Oh, I don't want to say easy because that's not that's not fair to Reading, but it's a, it's a nice fixture to start off with. Reading at home, isn't it, Ollie? I would say so, yeah. Um, at the moment, I think it's uh, the only caveat to that is it's a kind of case of check your phones every half hour at the moment, isn't it? Because you want to know what's happening in the market and whether you know somebody's going to come in or not. Um, and I don't know exactly what team is going to pick at the moment. It's always nice when you kind of go into a fixture feeling like I kind of know nine or ten of the team are going to be probably this. And that's always a good sign. Whereas at the moment... We're not kind of sure. It's it's kind of up in the air as to whether he's going to carry on with the back three, whether they go back to a back four and and, and midfield three. Um, so yeah, it's it's just a funny little period for us. I think we're going to have to work hard to get through this period. Um, so I'm pleased it's not Watford first. You know, 
um, or Brentford first because I think that could have, you know, that would have been really tricky. Um, so we kind of need, um, yeah, we, we if, if the fixture calendar had been a little bit trickier at the start of the season, then, you know, that could have been bad. So um, I'm hopeful that we just get through the first few weeks, like you kind of said, and, and uh, pick up some points. Um, I, yeah, and, and like I say, I'll just be glued to my phone trying to trying to find out um, who we're signing because I'm desperate to see some. Yes. We need some positives. You know, this has been a bit of a grim, grim, difficult kind of couple of weeks, and you know, with all the rumours about people leaving and stuff, and nobody coming in. So um, I'm hopeful that we get some positive updates pretty soon, and then hopefully we can start to build and look forward to a decent season. Yeah, no, absolutely. Corey, just a quick word on Reading before we go. I, I, yeah, I think it's a it's a great litmus test for Derby. Reading's, I mean, no disrespects to them, they're mid-table, upper mid-table. Um, and it's a good litmus test to start out. You know, you're not, obviously, like Ollie said, you're not going to play a team that's desperate for a win. Like, a, everybody's desperate for a win, but more so when it's Watford or Bournemouth or one of the teams that have just come down. Um, you're not playing one of the newcomers that are kind of an unknown quantity. You're playing Redding, who's been in the division a long time. We've got a lot of games against them. So it's a good litmus test for Derby. If they can go in there, they can play a bit better than they did with Barrow. You know, if they can play to the full potential, they can go to toe-to-toe with anybody in this league. So it'll be a good, it'll be a good measuring stick for where Derby are because of the position kind of where Redding are normally in the league. So that's my thoughts on it. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd, have, to, I'd have to echo what you both said. It, it does feel a... It, it, it could be a lot worse, let's put it that way. Um, and I think with just the... We're limping through the first couple of weeks, like we've said, actually, that the running in September, whilst three or four weeks ago, we looked at it and went, oh, Christ, we can make a... We can really make a decent start to this season for and really, really set our foot on, you know, get ourselves on the front foot. But now it's a case of, well, actually, if we can limp our way through that first couple of weeks and then get somebody back and get somebody in before that... October, which looks terrible, with uh, Norwich Forest, and I know there's a couple of others in there. Um, it would st- it would put us in good stead, I think. So that's all. That is the season review. Thank you very much, uh, as always, Corey, Jason. You're more than welcome. And Ollie, it's it's been fantastic uh, to get your opinion. Thank you very much for joining us uh, on on this on this season preview, and um, all the best with the writing and the podcast. Uh, and I'll certainly look forward to listening to more of your episodes this year. Thank you very much. My pleasure, and yeah, I'm afraid uh, I will be probably uh, still doing stuff for a little while. Yeah, it seems like uh, I think we've, I've just chalked up ten years actually. Um, so I've started work on a book project to um, to kind of cap that up. But um, yeah, um, so now we're probably looking at another ten years because, as I think um, we mentioned at the start of the podcast, it is a life term when you're oh, yeah. when you're in the Derby County. So <laughs> you've been doing this for ten years, Ollie, but you still you're still looking good, and you've still got your hair and. It's not completely white yet. So, you know, I, that, hey, I'll take that in a decade from now because me and Jay, I've been doing this since September with Jason and my hair's already started to turn and I feel older every time. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, Chris, um, who I do the, the podcast with, always always uh, says to me, you know, you, you get all sorts of new projects starting up all the time and, you know, they come and go. But um, the ones that stick are the ones that I, I think have just a bit of uh, maybe chemistry about them or something like that. And, um, you know, and some people are just a bit obsessive so <laughs> they're just gonna keep doing it so um yeah um it's it's it's, it's fun um you know and um you you get told very quickly um by the gift of twitter if you're wrong so uh you know yes. you, have have a, you have to have a hide like oh the derby fan base will tell you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely will um so yeah but um it's always good fun i really appreciate being asked to come on thank you guys yeah look forward Excellent. to it next time ollie yeah, it's 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 always great to have a good chat about something that we're all passionate about, obviously, and always always different opinions. And certainly at the start of the season, you know, optimist. It might sound to listeners, it might sound a bit of a doldrum podcast. It's not. We all, I can assure you, we are we are all quite optimistic for the season coming up. But we have to say it how we how we think it. Um, and I, I'm I'm in the game of being proved wrong. I really am. I'd I'd much rather be proved wrong than proven right. To be perfectly honest with you, when I'm when I'm coming up with a negative, that's for sure. So then, Corey, it's time for, as we've mentioned, the world-famous score prediction. And I'd just like to point out on last week's, anybody who caught the episode last week before the Barrow game, I got it absolutely spot on. Nil-nil after the game and a derby win on penalties. I didn't predict how many penalties, but maybe I'll have to remember that for the next round of the Cup on Tuesday. But Yeah, so, so I got that one right. Um, so it's one-nil to me. Well, don't uh, end up in A&E patting yourself on the back, Jason. 
No, I won't. I won't. <laughs> but that's one nil. I've made a, I've made a note. Um, so obviously there there is two uh, results to predict. We will predict the opening game against Reading on Saturday, and then because before we reconvene on the podcast next time, uh, we will have had the second round of the Carabao Cup against Preston at home, which is, I believe, been scheduled for a six thirty kickoff for some bizarre reason um, on Tuesday. So, Corey, you go for it. What's your prediction for, first of all, we'll do Saturday. I think it's going to be, I think I would go for 1-1 against Reading. Um, obviously, we, we don't know um, what players are we going to bring in, and, and it's still a little bit in flux, but you hopefully you hope for a better performance than what was against Barrow. You hope for a couple of those players that were injured to be back in uh, opening game of the season. Um, but again, you know, opening opening it's not really the opening game. It's kind of the second game, but the opening league game of the season is a bit strange uh, because you never know really how teams are going to lie. And I'm sure Reading strengthened over the summer as well. So I think a one, one would be something that I'm anticipating um, with hopefully a bit more excitement than what was against Barrow. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's probably more key than the result for me, but obviously we want to get off to the best possible start. So I mean, like you said, we've mentioned earlier with Ollie, we, we are five or six players short. Um, there are rumblings that t- there may be two in before the game on Saturday. Uh, but how much of a pre-season they've had, you know, in terms of to our levels, what we've been working at or anything like that, that's just the, the complete unknown. And you would probably expect anybody that did come in, um, almost as we're recording this on Thursday, it's going to be you know, a little late in the week. So I wouldn't expect too much about to see them on Saturday, probably a bit more on Tuesday for the cup. If we get them in um, just to, just to set them in on a cup game rather than a league game. Um, and there's no real news of anybody really being back fully fit. I know obviously Cocker, I don't think he's done his press conference just yet for the game on Saturday. So uh, I've seen pictures as I'm sure you have Corey of you know, Tom Lawrence running around on the field and, you know, things like that. And there's been messages on social media from Martin Waggon and things like that, but it doesn't sound as if any of those uh, are going to be fit for Saturday. So you're quite right. It's going to be a very similar, if not the same uh, team against Reading, but I'm actually going to, I don't know why I've just got this feeling that Derby are going to win uh, surprisingly and actually put on a, an half decent performance. I'm going to go, I'm dicing with one nil or two one. I would, you know, you know, my thoughts on normal. I can, I could never say Derby will keep a clean sheet because, because basically last season we couldn't keep clean sheets. Um, but actually thinking about the three additions to the back line uh, this season, I'm actually going to plump for one nil. I am going to go one nil Derby. I've got a feeling, I don't know why, um, but I do, I do think we're going to get after a winning start, which would be, which obviously would be great. Um, and going I mean, we, into, they have won the last two opening league games against Reading and Huddersfield, so there is, there's a bit of a streak to continue. Um, yeah, and obviously they've all been away. I mean, it, it has been a while since we played the first home game uh, of the season. Uh, sorry, the first game of the season at home. Um, if I think it stretches back about three or four years, if memory serves me right. I think we've been to Sunderland, like you say, we've done Reading, we've had Huddersfield, um, and we've always had a pretty, pretty solid, certainly away from home, pretty solid results. So at home, you've got, you've got a hope, um, which we will wait and see. So there's, there's the predictions: a one-one from Corey and a one-nil from me. And then before we go, guys, we're just going to again just touch on the uh, second round of the Carabao Cup, as, as we mentioned earlier to Ollie. It seems strange that there's potentially going to be first three or it might even be four rounds of the Cup in September. It's literally Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, all the way through till about Christmas, which is just seems bizarre with everything that's going on. But at the end of the day, that's they, they've got to fit it in and, and that's fine. So Derby will go, um, it's at home against Preston. They've drawn Preston. Um, so as I say, 6.30 kickoff on Tuesday at Pride Park. And again, Corey, you, you, as I've just mentioned there, if there's any incomings over the next couple of days, you would probably more expect to see those uh, for the cup game rather than, rather than the league. But again, still don't really expect anybody else to be back in, in, in terms of other squad players. So already you've kind of had the same side out against Barrow, against Reading, and potentially the majority of them are going to be playing against Preston if uh, the club are interested in progressing through to the next round and 
bringing in that little bit of extra prize money, you know. So, but I mean, don't get me wrong, Preston will be no schmucks. But obviously, we played them towards the back end of last season, beat them, uh, beat them at Deepdale one nil. Uh, actually, played pretty decently, if memory serves me right, for for, for some of that. But of course, that again, it, it's the same. It's the same thing. It's, it was it was with five or six different players than what we've got at our disposal at the moment. So. I think I'm actually going to go for a draw and penalties again. Um, I don't think it'll be nil-nil, though. I, I, I'm going to go 1-1. One, one. Uh, I don't know why I'm predicting us to do better against the championship side than we did against the against the league side, but that's what I'm going to go for. I am going to go for... I, I mean, in, in all fairness, Preston are probably going to be in the same position as Derby. They're going to put out a, a stronger side on Saturday, for the for obviously for the league game, than they probably are for the cup game. Um as we mentioned earlier, uh, to Wally, most Premier League players, uh, pre- Premier League teams don't bother putting a, a side out until the quarterfinals. I would fully expect most championship clubs who can get away with it will do something something similar. Because I think, it's a, as I said earlier, it's a distraction that a lot of championship clubs and certainly lower league sides probably don't really need, um, to be honest with you. So I, I'm going to go for 1-1, um, but I am going to go Derby, Derby to win. Uh, on penalties, um, I'm not going to predict how many we how many we score. Um, I think for me, it, it's looking at the game and, and seeing how the result goes uh, for both teams on on uh, on Saturday. Obviously, if, if Preston gets steamrolled, then I would think Alex Neal would probably put out a near full strength team to not necessarily as punishment, but to try to get things back on track against Derby. And um, I think Derby's pretty much at full strength as they can expect it to be right now. But obviously, like we've said, if you bring in some new sign-ins, it's, it's Thursday uh, Thursday afternoon now for you, Jason. So the idea of them coming in, two players coming in, training one day, uh, and they probably might be in the squad, maybe one of them. Um, but I would definitely expect any new signings to make a full debut on Tuesday. So um, it could be a completely different Derby County side. But again, it takes time to bed these players in and things like that. Um and I would think, I would think, you know, I think it's going to be, again, it's going to be a very competitive cup game. And I, I would be a little bit more bullish on this result. And I would say that Darby will, Darby will eke out a victory 2-1. Well, there we go. So we've got a, a draw from me and penalties um, and a 2-1 win in, in the cup from, from Corey. Uh, and we will, re, we will look back at those fixtures on our, on our review of those two games next week. Uh, on the podcast and look forward to the game on Saturday. Uh, Corey, I haven't got a clue who it is. I'm not, I've been that hyped about the first two games. I've not even checked uh, who uh, it is that we actually play on Saturday. It is Luton Town at Kenilworth Road. So we'll Ooh. be excited for that one. Well, that's going to be fun. Um, if, if last season's anything to go by, uh, that, that could be, that could be interesting. Um, but we'll obviously we'll we'll review that game and we'll uh, preview that game and we'll review the the two results in the week uh, next week's pod, and that wraps about up uh, for this episode, guys. So thank you very much for listening, uh, Corey. As always, thank you very much, and Jason, we'll speak welcome. to you next time. Lovely. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of the Rams Review Podcast. Please remember to get in touch on the socials. On Twitter, we are at Rams Review One. Our Facebook is Rams Review Podcast. Or you could drop us an email, ramsreview at hotmail.com. Until next time, thank you very much and up the Rams.